welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. Your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. All right. And the running joke, of course, is that Robert's never with us. So for those of you that have listened to the show regularly. Um, <laughs> and if you haven't ever seen Robert, go listen to the first, I don't know, two or three. <laughs> yeah, I think a it's couple probably, he was on. Yeah, it's probably no more than three. It's my yeah. guess. There was one later one that he showed up uh, a few months back. I yeah. Should, uh, I should notate that. In the next show, we'll, uh, we'll give you that link. So when you yes. want to see Robert's face, you can go back and look at right. that. For those of you who are wondering who this Robert guy is, check out show six or I don't know, whatever. So, all right. Well, uh, so what have you been doing this week, Jesse? Uh, playing guitar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Actually, I was kind of getting into like just kind of playing along with um, some of the old uh, ELO stuff. You remember uh, e- ELO from the 70s? Well, 80s too, I guess. I know them. I can't say I remember them because I was very young. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, that time frame stuff. So. I was uh, fairly young myself, but uh, l- less young than you were. But yeah, um, not the greatest. Like, uh, well, he's a pretty good guitar player. I mean, he, he had decent rhythm chops. He had good uh, chord progressions, and he threw some interesting stuff in there. He was a big Beatles fan, so you know he had some of those more interesting than just major and minor chords. Sometimes his solo chops were, mm, you know, basic rock and blues. Not not the greatest, but great production, great you know stuff. Um, what was his name? Jeff oh, Lynn. This? Jeff Lynn. Okay. He's kind of the mastermind behind the whole thing. And he has a, he had a couple tours. Well, he had a tour in 2001 and a new album, and that didn't go anywhere. And um, now he has a tour. I saw a live thing from a couple years ago, and it didn't go anywhere because <laughs> nobody's interested in them anymore. You know, but eh, it's good stuff. It was my uh, my formative stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's fun to go back and play some of that. So, what have you been doing? Not a whole lot, actually. You know, this two-week span uh, between this show and the last show was uh, had Thanksgiving in it. Oh, it did, yeah. Yeah, and I was gone for, you know, a decent chunk of time. So uh, not a whole lot of guitar practicing going on. But when it was going on, I've been working on stuff like uh, playing scales along one string. Mm-hmm. And because I'm not good at that. I mean, I can do it with a pentatonic scale, no problem. But I'm talking major scale. Right. Trying. I want to get some sort of... Uh, interesting licks where you hear people playing up and down the neck mm-hmm. along one string, uh, maybe quickly. And I figured yeah. first thing I probably should do is figure out the scale along the string right. and move like scale positions along the string fluidly before I start going, you know, wee, 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 or whatever, which yeah. is the effect. That's the sound I'm looking for too, by the way, for those of you who are listening. <laughs> wee, 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 wee. Wee, wee, wee. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what I'm looking for. I just thought, hey, this would be a cool thing to do. Um, in fact, you know, there's a part to Fade to Black by Metallica. Mm-hmm. Sounds like that's what they're doing. And so I think that would be cool to be able to do. Yeah. Um, I played a bunch of PRS guitars. We can talk about that a little later. Oh, we're going to talk about that new, was pretty new awesome. guitars. New yes. guitar- and a new amp. i got a new amp back here. Uh, right where my finger is pointing for those of you that are on video. Uh, Fender Bass Breaker. I got my hands on one, which... Apparently, it was a bit more difficult than I expected because uh, sold out lots of places, back ordered lots of places. So, uh, yeah, so I landed one thanks to uh, KNS Music here uh, in South Williamsport. Fantastic, Woo! fantastic shop. They always pull through for me, and I'm always happy to, to plug them on the show. In fact, yeah, we, should get the, we should get the guys from KNS on the show at some point. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bet they'd come on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Troy and Jeremiah, they're, they're cool peeps. Yeah. Yeah, we should definitely do that. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to report on playing wise other than, you know, some basic rhythm stuff and trying to get the swing out of my rhythm playing a little bit. He's still on about that. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's coming along. You know, I I set the metronome all the way down to like 75, which it's pretty hard to play rhythm slow. Yeah. Yeah. And so I feel pretty good about, you know, eighth notes without the swing. Mm-hmm. Uh, at 75 and I've gone up to as fast as 150 and that's where it gets easier because you're just going up and down up and down up and down right and right that's yeah. uh not, not as bad so yeah I suppose that's that's really about it I'll try to be better in the next two weeks and play more guitar so I can have more interesting things to talk about 
I'm interested in the single note stuff. I mean, there's there's a, or the single string stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff. I mean, there was a an old, I think, a violin piece air on a single string or something like that, an old classic thing that I think Ingve actually sort of took off on, on one of his solos. I can't remember what it was, but that was hit the beginning of it. And there's a lot of neat stuff like Thunderstruck, you know, the ACDC tune. I mean, there's a yeah. lot like open string with whatever you're throwing in in the scale. Yeah, and I feel like I need to be able to do that. And oh, yeah. or at least, you know, mess around with that some. And I hope I'm approaching it right. I really don't know how to approach it. And I won't have my next lesson for another week. I'm spending a three week gap of lessons because of, you know, Thanksgiving and other uh, commitments going on. I hope by next week with my lesson, I can talk to my instructor and say, hey, you know, this whole playing up and on one string, let's, am I approaching this right? Because right now I'm just like, what's the scale? Play C major scale up and down the string, look for patterns. And then, you know, try other um, keys, which I've been experimenting with other keys on different strings sure. and working towards that. Just trying to get it under my fingers. And I'm hoping that's the right approach. And maybe he can sort of direct me a little bit more. It sounds logical. Are you just um, like playing just the notes? Are you also like slurring and sliding? And I'm sliding. So, oh, yeah, excellent. I'll slide from like, you know, I'll, like I'll slide a whole step up a whole step or slide up a half step, depending on where I am, of course, on the scale. Right. Um, you know, doing some hammer on, some pull offs a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to I was working on this uh, thing from Justin Guitar where there's these three notes per um, string scale, which I'm comfortable with doing, but then turning them into like, you know, repeated pull offs or repeated hammer ons to make this sort of fast sounding playing. Yeah. And so I need to identify where the where you have a, a whole step and a half step sort of lined up. Right. So you can do that with your first, third, and fourth finger. Yeah. And that's sort of what I'm working towards. Um, and I, I don't know. It feels like it's a skill that I should already have after playing for four and a half years. But it's something that just hasn't come up. Well, I'll, to be honest, there's a lot of – to get the really fast-sounding stuff like that, um, I learned kind of early because I started off with like major and minor scales. And so you get those three notes per string – you know, across the six strings. And then I pretty quickly figured out that like, if you do that, not that I knew how to play Thunderstruck, it wasn't even out at that point, but, but that's sort of like pedal tone on an open string. And then a couple notes, it sounded faster and harder than it really is. And yeah. so that was like a trick that kind of, I got really quick. I didn't get into the blues boxes early, which most players do. And the difference there, of course, is that's like two notes per string. Right. So it just naturally isn't going to go as fast, you know what I mean, as as a three note, you know, major or minor. Right. Thing. And so yeah. it just depends on the sound you want. Do you want that kind of flurry of note, you know? Sure. And, and I kind of want to do some of that flurry of note stuff. I think it might be cool to add to my playing. Oh, yeah. And I'm very comfortable, you know, playing across the fretboard, but not down along the fretboard. And that's right. what I need to be able to. I can connect a couple of the blues. Uh, sort of the pentatonic positions together. I can do that pretty good. I can run up and down the fretboard like that, but not the rock kind of thing. I guess yeah. it's hard for me to describe, but it's not, I'm not able to do what I want to be able to do yet. Yeah. And so I need to work on that. Um, yeah. Cool. So, uh, do you have any birthdays or? I do. I have awesome. three. All right. So let's hit the birthdays. We have uh, Jim Hall, a uh, jazz great, awesome uh, player. Uh, December 4th, 1930. Uh, yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> and happy one birthday, of, <laughs> happy birthday, Jim. Um, Randy Rhodes, my, uh, uh, I loved Randy. Uh, December 6th, 1956. And Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top fame, uh, December 16th, 1949. So happy birthday to wonderful six string slingers. 1949 for Billy Gibbons, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you can still play. Oh, Absolutely. So fantastic. Well, happy birthday to uh, all of those uh, listed and to, you know, any of you that might be celebrating a birthday somewhere around the time that you're listening to the show. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. I hope you, you get probably, everything you want. <laughs> yeah, you're probably a guitarist too. And if you didn't, you should listen to our holiday extravaganza show. Indeed. This episode 31. The most recent one was episode 31. Birthday counts as a holiday. So At, to me, it's my favorite holiday. Yeah. And it's if like, you had a birthday in December, that's kind of awesome. You get the guitar for your birthday and for Christmas. Aha. <laughs> like how you're thinking. Or, of course, there's you don't have to have that order. You can get the guitar for your birthday. And the, or no, you said that. Yeah, there's so many ways you could yeah. uh, permutate. There's all, all kinds of permutations. <laughs> yeah. 
I you get like a pedal for New Year's. I mean, I don't know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't. I, I mentioned that I got this this Fender bass breaker. It's a uh, it's the 007, seven watt one by ten combo. Um, and I would love to be able to tell our listeners all about it. But I've had it in my house for just slightly over an hour. And I'm saying like <laughs> an hour and 10 minutes. And since that time, I have had dinner and then I had to do dishes and other grown up things. So I was not able to test this thing out yet. Uh, so the next show, uh, if we have time, I'll tell you all about the fantastic bass breaker. I've played it in several different stores over the period of um, – actually, since it came out. I think I've been playing it, testing it since about a month ago. Wow. And uh, I do like it. Um, it. There are some cool features. It has this treble boost. Uh, I would say a negative is that it does not have reverb. Ooh, okay. Okay. But that's why God invented reverb pedals. That's true. So, you know, we could we can get around that. And uh, it does have um, the capability of connecting to a speaker. So if I decide I really miss the 12-inch speaker, I can get a 12-inch cab and just stick it on there and right. then we're set. I, I came really close to seriously considering the 7-watt um, head with the tw- um, 1x12 cab. That was 650 mm-hmm. And th- what I got was 450 450. Yeah. And so I just decided, you know, I think I'm going to stick with the one by 10. It's replacing a one by 10 anyway. Mm-hmm. And if I decide I like that uh, cabinet, I like that, well, if I want to go up to that one by 12, I can get the cabinet. The cabinet's like 250. Sweet. So, I mean, when it comes to like amp stuff, that's the base breaker cabinet is not bad. I could probably find a less expensive cabinet too somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds cool. I know I, when you mentioned the amp to me, I uh, went out and looked on some of the forums, um, and there's some activity on it. There's a lot of people looking at that, which I guess explains why <laughs> you can't find one. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, interesting what people were saying about it, and uh, generally well liked. It depends on what you like. Yeah, absolutely. And even the manual, I started. I read the first paragraph of the manual, and it basically gives an homage to the the um, baseman, mm-hmm. right? And, and talk about breaking. They don't say the word blues breaker. Of course not. It's another right? company. <laughs> yeah. But you know the way it's worded is like okay, this is a this is a blues breaker, uh, or at least it's uh, similar. I shouldn't say it's a blues breaker. It's it's similar. Yeah. So anyway, um, next episode we'll talk more about that that amp, and maybe we'll play through it a little bit so people can hear it. Um, they can hear my crappy playing. Woo-hoo. So yeah. So. Uh, I thought one of the things we talk about, because you and I are sharing a growing common mutual interest, if you will, yeah. in uh, PRS guitars. So Paul Reed Smith from my home state of Maryland. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And yeah, uh, this is a special thing because now, I, not that I don't like your guitars because I like them and I have a special affinity for your 339 and your uh, semi hollow body Les Paul. You do. Uh, but we don't really share any guitars that we, you know. You go very Fender Gibson, and I go very Parker and Quartz. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, so uh, right. and, and in the old days, Ivan is, but uh, but the Paul Reed Smith is actually maybe maybe someday will be a point of commonality. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is probably how it'll work, right? I'll get one probably first because <laughs> I'll just you know have a weak moment and just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, because the one I want is definitely beyond impulse buy. Yeah. Um, so actually, I should talk about what I've played. All right. So I went to a large um, store um, in Harrisburg while I was coming back from Thanksgiving visiting the family. And I did, as as a guitar player should, you look at the cities you're driving through and you say, gee, what guitar stores are in that city that I could mm-hmm. stop at? And, you know. Uh, annoy my wife while I say, "Why don't you come hang out at this guitar store with me for an hour or so?" And uh, if you loved so, me, you would come to this guitar store. <laughs> and, and she does, and she's, she does. She's a trooper. She's a trooper. She really is. Yeah, she, she she's like, "Yeah, I'll I'll sit there and listen to you play." And she even provides commentary. I mean, how much more you know could you ask for? That's awesome. She does give you her honest opinion. She does. She's like, "Oh, I like that sound better than that sound, or whatever the case may be." So that that's helpful. Uh, and I figure part of it, she has to hear whatever I get. So That's she true. might as well like it too. I mean, you know, so I played um, the PRS 
uh, Korean model, the SE. Now, the, there there is a I think an SE standard model that that comes in around five hundred bucks. I played the Korean um, that comes in around seven fifty. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that SE model. Now, if you want to get strictly technical on it, that's a PRS, not a Paul Reed Smith, because the headstock has PRS on the nameplate mm-hmm. and then on, on the instrument, the trust rod plate, excuse me. Okay. And then the rest of the headstock just says SE Custom. Uh huh. It's only the S2 models and the core models that have Paul Reed Smith. On I never headstock. noticed that. Well, I didn't either. And I watched a video by this uh, guy. His name is Philip McKnight. He's worth checking out on YouTube. Um, if you haven't heard his stuff, he's got some fantastic videos on how does a compressor work? Uh, mm-hmm. what, is it, what does a compressor do? He has videos on um, uh, Mexican-made strats versus American-made strats, Chinese-made strats versus – and what are the actual differences? And he sells guitars and he'll show you. He takes, a, he takes a neck off the strat and shows you like all these different things. He does um, Epiphone versus Gibson. What are the differences? What, how are you spending your money? And he does the Korean versus American, the core model, PRS. Right. And he's very um, – He's very upfront and honest. He goes, this is what you're paying for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's refreshing to hear the kind of video. So, Phil, I don't know if you listen to our show or not, but uh, good good shows. And I recommend that any of our listeners check out his um, YouTube uh, channel because he's got some good stuff on there. Anyway, um, he pointed that out in his video, and I didn't notice it until I actually sat down and looked at the headstocks when I was – playing at the store. I'm like, ah, fair enough. There is a, um, the word Paul Reed Smith does come up on the back of the headstock of the SE where it says, you know, this guitar is made by, I think it's New World Guitar Manufacturers or something along those lines in Korea. Factory chosen by Paul Reed Smith or something like that. But it's like a note that's on the back of the headstock and it's not taped on. It's actually on the headstock. Yeah. Um, So, not that that is actually important at all. It's, it's a, the SE is a fantastic guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoyed playing it. Um, and then when I played that guitar, I, or actually after I played that guitar, excuse me, I played an S2. I played an S2 Custom 24. So everything I played was Custom 24. And uh, wow. Mm-hmm. So the, custom, the S2 comes in at $13.99. It's pricey. Yeah. Okay. I liked the neck better. Yeah. I like the pickups a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Did I like them $600 better? I don't know. But here's the thing. I liked it enough that I would probably go that route. Yeah. Because the it's the neck, the fretboard's rounded like it should be. Right. Right? It has a good feel to it. Now, the, the, um, the neck is, what I think, what they call uh, – oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Stand no, I cannot remember what they call the neck. They have two they have, types. Yeah, they have different kind of contours. Yeah, the S two has the thicker. It only has the thicker contour. Yes, which is but, my problem with the S two. But go on. <laughs> let me say this: it's nowhere near as thick as my um, SG. Yeah. Okay. Right. I would say it's a comfortable cross between my Strat and my LP. Okay. All right. Scale length's about I think it's twenty five inches. Hmm. And uh, I the, the humbuckers were fantastic. Uh, when I did the coil tapping, mm-hmm. that were some of the best single coil taps I've ever heard on a guitar. Because my Epis, I love my Epis, but they're weak. When yeah. you do the coil tap, there you you can notice a difference. But th- that's you know my most expensive Epi is a six hundred dollar guitar, right? Right. So this is a very different creature that we're talking about with the S two. Finish was good quality. It just played well. Yeah. Did uh, did the coil taps sound good to you on the SEs? Uh, yes, they did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not as good as the S2. Right. But better than my Epis. Well, I think the difference there is, I mean, the Epi has the uh, kind of historic thing they have to hit. You know what I mean? I mean, it's got to be right. it's got to be kind of a classic Les Paul vibe, unless it's going to say the modern, you know, gangbanger SG model or something, you know, where it's like got the, you know, heavy metal vibe. Um, and Paul Reed Smith doesn't necessarily, I mean, they kind of, I think came in, you know, with, Hey, this is the best of both worlds sort of thing. And so they made a special attention to making their humbuckers at least workable as when they split and when they split and combined them. So, yeah. yeah. 
I think they now, I mean, I have to say I was, I was very impressed with that guitar. Mm -hmm. I, I, if it wasn't for the color, I wasn't a big fan (laughs) of the color. I could have, I've, Oh, I couldn't have walked out with it. Who am I joking? <laughs> but I would have loved to, have, right? I, I'm interested in the black. That's the one I'm really interested in. Uh, but uh, I was, I was impressed. You could see this was a red uh, finish. You could see the flame underneath mm-hmm. of it, and it's not, it's not the full flame maple. I think what they do on the S2 is they do a thinner flame top. Yeah. So, uh, but there's a maple cap on it, right? But I think what they then do is put an additional layer. I know they do that for sure on the SEs. I could be wrong about the S2s, but I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing to keep the cost down. Yeah, well, I know, I mean, well, the the, the core lines, uh, two things. One, they're real maple caps. Yes. I know on the imports, and this goes across manufacturers, whether it's Cork, Ibanez, um, you know, Paul Reed Smith's, you know, imports. Um, usually the maple is just a veneer. I mean, yeah. so that's a sixteenth of an inch or less of actual maple. So it's not really going to affect the tone it, like a maple cap will often brighten up. And I'm not going to get into tone wood <laughs> arguments, <laughs> whatever, but that's the idea. And right. um, but that shouldn't really affect the look of it. But Paul Reed Smith, um, what you're seeing there is they, I think, were the ones that pioneered this ultra three, like the ten top idea. You know, where it's like we have these, you know, really hot, you know, flamey or quilted, you know, tops. And I think they're the ones that developed this thing where they stain it with like a black, you know, a dark gray or something like that. Then they sand that off and it gives a more uh, 3D sort of, um, you know, look to the to the flame, even if it doesn't end up with any gray in it. I mean, these right. other colors, they had that step where it just it makes that 3D more, you know, it enhances it. But that's a costly step to do. So, you know, right. they're not going to do that on the, the lower lines, whether they be imported or even American. Right. Yeah. And I have to say, um, the SE, I want to make this pretty clear. I would be happy with that guitar. Well, and that's the question. Yeah. So it's like one of these things where it's like, well, this is a great guitar. And if I didn't know about the S2, I'd be happy. Yes. But that S2 is out there, darn it. But I don't know <laughs> about the S2. So actually, I should say I played four PRSs, okay, while I was there because I forgot about one of them. Mm-hmm. So before I talk about the, the highest end model that I played, I went over to the used guitar section of the store and right there just happened to be one of their single cuts. Mm-hmm. Also an S2. Uh, it was in their smoke blue crab color. OK. That's a nice um, color. Yeah. And it was a, I wasn't too impressed with that coloring, actually. Um, I could see why people would like it. Don't get me wrong. It's just it's interesting. I, I want blue, the, blue. I like the whale blue. That is pretty. Yeah. And that's what I would go for if I want blue. So uh, I have to say that guitar was just like my Les Paul, but more comfortable. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a good. Vibe. That was a comfortable playing guitar, um, but I, it was it was a guitar that would be really hard for me to say I should get this because it was just close enough to my LP that it'd be hard to justify that purchase. Yeah, I'm much um, more of a fan of the the double cuts anyway. Yeah, yeah, and especially because one of the things that driven me towards PRS is the custom 24, the 24 frets. I doubt I'll ever use frets numbers 23 and 24, but I don't have a 24 four fret guitar, so by God, I should have one. <laughs> um, so I put back the uh, single cut, and I was getting ready to grab that, uh, that 60th anniversary Les Paul that at one point in my life I was in love with. Mm-hmm. I have since moved on. Not the 60th anniversary, sorry, 60th anniversary Strat. Right. Uh, that said, I did put those pickups on my Christmas list. <laughs> did you? So if Santa comes through with that, you and I have got a small project. Um, fire up the soldering gun. <laughs> yeah, fire up the soldering gun. So we're going to take the uh, standards out of my Strat and put uh, this for a while and just see how that how, what that sounds like. Because they do sound like bells. They're nice. Anyway, um, back to the PRSs. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, right there, as I was reaching for that Strat, was a custom core model. Mm. Tw- core, twas- 24 core. Um, they were asking $2,500 for it. Mm-hmm. It had the uh, two jacks, a piezo jack. It had a standard um, uh, pickup jack, passive, I guess I should say. And uh, it was nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took it, played it. Actually, I played everything through up the blues breaker they had in the store there. And... Um, I have to say, I like the S2 better. Really? 
Yeah. Um, sound or feel or both or uh, sound. Feel was pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did it but, have the same neck contour as the S2? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it did not have the thin re- pattern regular. That's what they call it. Okay. Pattern regular, and I think it was a pattern regular thin. Right. Um, anyhow, one of the things that turned me off, and maybe that was just this particular guitar, is I didn't feel like the volume knobs did a whole lot until you got up to nine or ten. Mm. So it felt like as I went down past, you know, let's say eight and a half, it was just off. Right. And I was actually, I, I turned the volumes to, to like uh, six and a half because I wanted to hear what they sound like low volume, you know, what kind of cleans I could get out of the, the amp. And um, I was like, this isn't making any noise. Weird. I checked the jack and everything, and I was like, this is weird. But I cranked up the volume all the way, and it was at playing at a reasonable volume. But it, but I noticed it didn't activate till about, like I said, eight and a half, nine. I thought, that's just weird. Um, interesting. Yeah. So I don't know if it was a particular problem with that guitar or if it's something to something that PRS does that you don't maybe hear these effects of volume unless you've got the amp turned way up. I, I, I have, still hear the difference. I mean, that's I, mean, I would think so. I don't know why that would be that way. I mean, it should be the same kind of audio taper yeah. volume control that you get. Yeah. Now, I played it for a while. I was like, mm-hmm. this is a nice guitar. OK. Um, and I liked it better than I think I mentioned last show. I played a three thousand dollar custom shop Fender. Mm-hmm. I liked it way better than a three thousand dollar custom shop Fender. Okay, mm-hmm. no, they're not even close comparison. All right, um, but as I was playing it, my wife looks at me and she goes, "I like the red one better." Yeah, and the red one was the S two. I'm like, I agree. I I, I do too. Um, and so even if I had the twenty five hundred bucks to plop down right there and then. I would have went with the S2. Right. Well, you know, it gets to the point where there's there's some – it's kind of diminishing returns in, in oh, everything, right. you know. And so the question is just the things that you get, the things you pay for, are they worth it to you? Yeah. And and that's the truth in anything from the basic, you know, the pickups to, you know, whatever. You know, many people will pay hundreds of dollars for like a pickup that's designed exactly the same as blah, blah, blah or whatever. And right. it's like, yeah, okay, but some of us don't. Go that route. Well, yeah, the idea, I think, with the pickups uh, in the SE model, I think what Paul Reed Smith did was send his American-made pickups over to Korea. Uh, was it GNB? Is that the company? Global World something? Is that what Global, it's- yeah, I can't remember. I, yeah, G- I can't remember. Anyway, he sent it there. They're, they're, they're fine quality pickup makers mm-hmm. are over you know, um, in Asia, and they cloned that pickup, right? Um, so <clears throat> I think the... Um, I think the S2 has those pickups or slightly different pickups in them. They're not the pickups they make in Stevensonville, which is where Stevensville, which is where uh, PRS has his factory. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things you're paying for, of course, you know, for the the core model is that you're paying for the American made pickups. Sure. The, all that stuff is, you know, American made there. The S2 is cheaper because they've streamlined the process. Mm-hmm. There's some thinner woods going on. There's, uh, you know, uh, cheaper hardware. Uh, mm-hmm. The bridge, I think, is Korean made on the S2. I think the routing is a little different, too. It's not quite as um, arched, you know. No, it's not. Kind of yeah, it doesn't have that. There's a beveling that it doesn't have. Yeah. Again, all these, yeah, if you're, if you're going to take a $3,000 guitar – and bring it down to a fourteen hundred dollar price point. You've got to do things. You got to make sure. changes, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Particularly you know? if you're going to make it here, yes, in America. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, I, I didn't feel like when I was playing the S two that the difference is detracted from the playing experience. Well, at some point, it just it's different. I mean, there are people yeah. who would actually prefer the various things that you would cut the cost. So, for those people, you certainly. I mean, obviously, a Strat is much uh, less expensive to build. Than a Paul. There's no, uh, right. you know, the routing is different. It's a slab of wood, et cetera. So it doesn't matter how good, if you prefer a Strat, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're right. going to get away cheaper. I mean, unless you want something from 1962 or something. Slightly off topic. I saw in a catalog, a $6,500 Stratocaster. Uh-huh. Oh, was it, was it vintage or was it new? No, yeah. no, oh. it was new. 
Yeah, I see. Well, this is it's one of those things where they're trying to, my guess is, recreate something, you know, from the past exactly as much as possible. Which, okay, I mean, if that's your thing and you have the 6500, I suppose. But, I mean, you know, here's the thing. Leo Fender did things practically. Yes. I mean, his pickups were not like, you know, he didn't, uh, you know, navel gaze for weeks trying to – it's like, let's make this thing work. And so, and right. they, they vary because it wasn't even an exacting process. And so, yeah, he would laugh. Yeah, <laughs> I know? think so. I <laughs> like, think so. But, you know, it's just whatever you want. I mean, if you have that yeah. kind of – dosh then go for it oh yeah no no i'm not saying you shouldn't buy one i'm saying that i just can't justify it myself yeah for, well, for me exactly i mean i'm not so, after that sort of holy grail it's like i yeah. want something that plays and feels the way i want it right even if i had the kind of money i couldn't i don't think justify that uh, mm-hmm. but anyway back to prs uh, they do have a satin series coming out for s2 oh really it's either out now or just recently released i believe and uh, I have to say, I didn't see one in person, mm-hmm. but uh, I've seen them online. I've seen them on sites like Sweetwater or whatever. It does a pretty good job of sort of zooming in on the finish and whatnot. Right. And it, I would say it looks a lot like an SG Faded. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a cheaper it's, finish to apply, so it should yeah. uh, knock it a little bit off the price yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think those come in closer to a thousand, nice. and uh, I believe the finish from what the video said, I think was about a mil thick. Are they still going with the standard pattern neck, or are they going uh, have an option of the thin neck? Because here's the thing: yeah. <laughs> I like the ST. I mean, I'm I'm a semi hollow body and hollow body sucker, you know. And so what I'm I'm what's piqued my interest is the S2 semi hollow 22 fret because semi hollow and with a trim, that's a hard combination to get with a good yeah. trim. Um, yep. And and a strat shape. I mean, if you want to go with something like a big speed fine. If you want to go with something, you know. But what I want is stratty double cutaway. You know, with a working trim. I don't want a big speed. I don't. And the only thing I found, you know, so far like, was the Ibanez, which is a nice guitar. I have the red uh, AWD um, seventy two, AWD eighty two. One of those. Um, go give Google that, people, if you want to see it. It's a nice <laughs> guitar, you know. But the trim is. Eh. And that's being charitable. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Paul Reed Smith has a very good trim design that they do. stays in tune well and all that. So here's the S2. It's great. Nice colors available. Boom. Except thick neck. <laughs> or thicker than I prefer. I mean, I'm used to Parker's, which are really thin, you know. And so... I'm thinking that they're only putting one neck on those guitars to keep the cost down. That'd be my guess. I think that's probably true. So what I'm limited to is waiting until they may have another option, getting one and sanding the crap out of the neck. (laughs) Well, you can go on eBay. You can find a used core model for a few hundred dollars more than an S2. I've seen a couple core models out there used that were about 1700 and then you get into this kind of weird situation where it's like, okay, but where do I stop then? Because if I'm going to go above that, now it's like, okay, right. But boy, a hollow body too is an awesome guitar, <laughs> right? Right. And you can start getting used ones of those. And now we're looking at a, probably a few grand. Sure. And I'm thinking about it, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I, I hear you. Um, it's one of those things that. I don't know. I can tell you the trim on the S2 is uh, Korean made, but the nut is American. It's the same as they put on the core. Uh, for those of you on video, uh, I do know that my video is frozen, but uh, audio is working fine, so we'll just keep rolling. Uh, feel free to take a screenshot. You know, you can make me your your desktop image. All right. <laughs> so uh, we were saying that the uh, the tremolo is a Korean made on the S2s. The nut is the same one they put on the core models. There are locking tuners on the S2s, but they're not the same tuners they use in the core models. So there's some differences. Uh, I would, you know, if you're interested, I would find a store that has a selection of the different ranges and go play them. Uh, I definitely, definitely liked the S2. Yeah. They make some good guitars. Uh, that's they, that's they all do. there is. <clears throat> yeah. They really do. So uh, since we're having the video te- uh, difficulty, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this episode up. If you enjoyed what you hear today, uh, or if you happen to work for PRS and want to hand out some guitars, tweet us at SST Show. All right. Uh, or you can email me, chris at jestercat.com. 
And uh, we'd love to hear suggestions. We'd love to hear comments. We would love to hear um, show ideas. Please um, leave us a review on iTunes uh, or uh, leave us a comment on YouTube. That really helps us out. And uh, we'd love to sort of engage with you guys. So until next time, folks, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 